I'd like you guys to imagine walking into your clinic exam room and seeing the bright eyes of your 75-year-old patient, Mr. H. So Mr. H is a retired school teacher. He's traveled the world and he speaks three languages. He's currently completely enamored with German literature in German. Uh, and as you walk into the room, his smile broadens. And he says to you, I'm so glad to be here. When I'm at home, I feel like I'm waiting to die. So Mr. H is a real patient, and he really did say that to me. And as I continue to be aware, I, I personally, when he first said that to me, I was shocked. Um, I didn't know what to say. Um, and that 20-minute appointment ended up being a 60-minute appointment. <laughs> um, and then I realized as I was talking to more and more of the population that I care for, especially the ones that kept insisting to see me monthly. So I had a whole bunch of people that kept saying, I need to see you monthly. And I'm like, okay, but your HIV's been controlled for a decade, and you know your other stuff's under control. And they're like, I'm falling apart. I need to see you monthly. I began to realize that what was really unifying all of their needs to see me was an overlying level of loneliness. They were lonely. And that really got me interested in this topic of loneliness and social isolation in older people living with HIV. And uh, I appreciate you allowing me to talk about this today. So here's my disclosures. So what is loneliness? Loneliness is different from social isolation. And really, loneliness is that aversive feeling that you get or that aversive cue when there is a discrepancy between what you would prefer out of social relationships and what you actually get out of social relationships. And the late John Cacioppo, who really was a pioneer in this field of loneliness and, and isolation, liked to call it an evolutionary cue. He basically said, it's like hunger. You know, hunger tells you, I need to eat so I can survive. Loneliness tells you, I need to seek out meaningful relationships so I can survive. And he basically liked to say that, you know, as humans, as we evolved, we didn't have the biggest teeth or the biggest claws, we weren't the fastest, and what gave us an advantage over the saber-toothed tiger, or famine, or the HIV epidemic, is our ability to collaborate with each other. And that collaboration is always best when you have mutual relationships that are trustworthy. Uh, and this hypothesis is supported by some of his very early work that suggested that lonely people, uh, loneliness itself really does promote some self-preservation because lonely people are hyper-vigilant to threats. And they did a lot of work where they would show lonely and non-lonely people a big picture with a whole bunch of activities going on and human interactions. And they noticed that lonely folks tended to really focus on the interactions that appeared to be threatening. Uh, versus not only people that, that tended to spend more time looking at interactions that were pleasant and friendly. Oh, sorry, social interaction is, is, is much more objective. It's literally just a lack of contact between an individual and society. So loneliness and isolation are actually really common across the world, but I'm going to focus mostly on our US epidemic. Forgive our international folks for me not expanding further, but I was told I had 22 minutes. Um, if you look at different surveys, anywhere between a third to 46% of people in the U.S. say that they feel lonely or left out. That's a huge amount of people. Uh, about 25% say that they don't feel that people really understand them, and 40% state that their social relationships are not meaningful. That's huge. And this appears to be changing over time. So back in 1985, uh, respondents commented that, 10% uh, of respondents commented that they did not discuss important matters with anyone. And more recently, in 2005, that number went up to about 25%. So this is an increasing problem in the US. And uh, there's lots of potential hypotheses as to why this is happening. I know a lot of people like to blame social media. Um, but the Cigna study from which I'm showing most of this data really suggested that there weren't differences in heavy users versus never users of social media and prevalence of loneliness. So there's more to the story than just social media. Um, other people say more people are living alone. And it is true that in general, if you're living with others, you are less likely to be lonely, but not if you're a single parent. <laughs> so if you're a single parent living with your kids, you are more likely to be lonely. So it's, it's complicated. The causes of, of, of this epidemic or this increase in amount of loneliness that we're seeing in America is highly complex and, and likely very variable based on the population that you're looking at. Of note, a lot of these 
surveys state that there are three major peaks across the lifespan of loneliness. One happens in adolescence and early adulthood. I, I think we can all imagine that that's a difficult time. Another happens in middle life, when people are kind of going through their midlife crisis. And the last peak happens as adults enter later life, so as people are getting older. And at least for people who are living with HIV, there are some potential concentrated and unique experiences that may contribute to their loneliness and their experience of loneliness. Unique to them, uh, a lot of older adults who are living with HIV had significant loss of peers and partners during the AIDS epidemic, and, and that rapid depletion of their social network uh, is, is crippling and likely contributes to some of the survivor guilt and post-traumatic stress disorder that encompasses the, what some people refer to as the AIDS survivor syndrome. Similarly, HIV, older HIV, uh, older people living with the HIV experience stigma not only against HIV, but also against their age. And, you know, they could also then experience more stigma if they are a person of color, if they're trans, if they're unstably housed, if they're a substance user, and that stigma, both internalized and externalized, can sometimes pile up that really makes it difficult for them to develop new interactions and reach out and then take the risk of being personally harmed, either because that's a risk they perceive or one that's actually externally real. Mental health issues play a, a place in here as well. Uh, if you're incredibly depressed or anxious, it could impair your social and cognitive function. And medical comorbidities, so if you've got peripheral arterial disease, if you have peripheral neuropathy, you've got bad COPD, it's difficult for you to physically get out of your house. So the medical comorbidity could also be contributing to this ongoing loneliness they experience. And socioeconomic factors. If you run out of money a week before the end of the month, you are more focused on getting food to eat than you are buying a $5 coffee and trying to make a new friend. So there's a lot of factors that conceptually could be contributing in older adults with HIV. And certainly there are a couple studies now that have characterized this and suggest that the older adults with HIV are more lonely than their HIV sure negative counterparts. Uh, the first study was done in 2006 by Charlie Emlett. He looked at social isolation, so that's a little different again from loneliness, and he saw that about 39% of older people with HIV were socially isolated, but that went up to 54% if you were looking only at older adults of color. Meredith Green, um, right there, <laughs> published a more recent study characterizing loneliness in their silver cohort, which is uh, in HI two HIV clinics at UCSF, um, and found that 58% of them were reporting loneliness. Uh, and she correlated loneliness with being more likely to smoke, being an at-risk alcohol user or user of other substances, having low social support, having depressive symptoms, and poor to fair quality of life. Um, she also saw in an unadjusted analysis that loneliness appeared to be associated with self-reported functional impairment, basically uh, difficulty performing instrumental activities of daily living, but uh, that sort of fell out of the model when they introduced some other factors. So, unfortunately, we don't get a 
why we're seeing these epidemiologic trends. And there are a lot of different factors. So certainly medical decision making um, is impacted. If you have friends and family that can help you make decisions or help implement recommendations from your provider, then it's easier to do that. I think a classic example is a colonoscopy. In order to get a colonoscopy, you need to have someone pick you up and drive you home and watch you for a little bit to make sure that you are not negatively impacted by the medication that they give you to knock you out. But if you don't have anybody, or if you're afraid that if you ask your one friend for help, it'll bother them, you don't go and get your colonoscopy. Health behaviors, looking, so a lot of folks also say that, well, lonely people are maybe, they don't exercise as well, and they don't eat as well, and the data doesn't necessarily support that. Probably the only health behavior that is, a, is more common in people who are lonely is suicide. But again, that probably contributes a small amount to that estimated increased risk of death. What is more likely happening and more likely the cause of the, the epidemiologic links with loneliness are the impact of stress that loneliness causes on people. So people who are lonely perceive that they have higher levels of stress or they have added stress. Um, but they don't actually objectively get exposed to more stress. So they, they're not getting more stress. They just perceive that they have more stress. They also... Uh, appear to be affected more by stress, so they react differently to the stress that's in their lives. They report that they have more hassles in life, that they have less intense uplifts in their day to day, and that they have more stressful day events. And lastly, they don't have a good stress buffering. So what stress buffering is, is your relationships around you kind of help buffer the impact of stress. And lonely versus non-lonely people have equal opportunities to interact with other people. But lonely persons report that their interactions are of poorer quality and didn't provide as much support and comfort. So this impact of stress is actually observable. Lonely persons have higher total peripheral resistance, lower cardiac contractility, lower heart rate, and lower cardiac output, and they often have really terrible sleep. And there is much more data looking at the impact of loneliness on immune function. So in people who are lonely, they have higher levels of EBV titers. In people with HIV who are lonely, they have higher levels of HHV6 titers. Uh, less natural killer cell activity has been observed, poor immune response to influenza vaccination, and increased circulating levels of cortisol. So it seems that loneliness is contributing to this kind of maybe some sort of immunosuppression because of the higher levels of cortisol that are associated with their inability to manage their stress. But I want to remind you guys, the diseases that are associated with loneliness is, are things like heart disease and stroke. These are not diseases of immunosuppression. These are inflammatory diseases. So how do we explain this paradox? Uh, this is probably, so Steve Cole um, from UCLA has really pioneered trying to understand, you know, what is going on here with the stress response, loneliness, and health issues. And he hypothesized that high cortisol levels all the time desensitize the glucocorticoid receptor pathways that mediate a transcription or response to cortisol. Basically, your cortisol receptors stop hearing the cortisol because they're constantly exposed to it. Kind of like how my children stop listening to me because I'm constantly yelling at them. Um, and this data is actually supported with animal models. There is some evidence for this. Uh, but Steve said, okay, that's a hypothesis. Now I'm going to prove it. So he did a transcriptome analysis of 14 people who were either very lonely or not lonely at all. And he found 209 gene transcripts were differentially transcribed. Um, and so the, the top here, uh, I can't show it again. So the top is, is lonely. It says isolated. And then he says isolated and integrated, but it's lonely and non-lonely. Um, oops. So what he found is, as far as genes that were upregulated, things like cell growth, differentiation, and cell cycle progression uh, kind of went along with the downregulation of cell cycle inhibitors and apoptosis-related genes. He also saw that there were some pro-inflammatory genes that were upregulated, IL-1 beta, IL-8, and IL-10 RA, along with others, as well as regulators of prostaglandin synthesis. But he saw that genes associated with the type 1 interferon response were downregulated. Uh, as well as B cell maturation and differentiation genes. 
So in summary, lonely persons seem to demonstrate broad genomic immune activation with selective reductions in B cell dysfunction and the ability to respond to, to viruses. Um, later work, he showed that the cells that are most impacted uh, by these changes are the plasma cytoid dendritic cells and monocytes. So taking it a little step further, um, well, let me go back in. So this uh, pattern has actually now been evaluated in multiple different types of adverse states and seems to be conserved. It's a very familiar uh, transcript or, or um, transcriptome seen in people that experience stress of any type. So we kind of now look at this as like a, the reason why stress negatively impacts people. But um, I do want to talk about one other study because uh, they looked at some markers I think that we are familiar with in the HIV world. So these authors wanted to try to figure out, does loneliness promote inflammation in the setting of acute stress? And they first looked at 134 healthy but sedentary overweight persons. These persons were actually participating in another study, but they were overall healthy and that's kind of why they selected them. And they gave them a stress test, which included math and speaking in front of the public, just like I'm doing right now, and I'm having my own little stress test here. And they, they did find that both TNF-alpha and IL-6, both groups, lonely and non-lonely, started out at the same baseline. But after that stress test, people who were lonely expressed higher levels of both of these inflammatory markers. To validate this finding, they tested it in another group of, of folks, uh, 144 breast cancer survivors, and they wanted to see, because these persons had just recently gone through a huge stressful event, they wanted to see if they still see a loneliness effect in the acute response to stress. And indeed they did. So they looked at TNF-alpha, which actually did not show an acute response, but IL-6 still did, as did IL-1-beta. So this evidence does suggest that loneliness does contribute to increased inflammation in people who are healthy and non-healthy. So I don't like to give talks where I'm only talking about doom and gloom, and I always try to introduce the other side of the coin. And there are protective factors that can, that can help people who are lonely so that they don't necessarily succumb to the negative health effects associated with it. Uh, I think wisdom is one that is recently come into awareness. Uh, the group at UCSD led by Dilip Justy has looked at three different cohorts, college students, people who are actively working, and seniors. And throughout all those cohorts, they see an inverse correlation between loneliness and wisdom. The question is, how do you get people to improve their wisdom? I'm not sure. If anyone has ideas, let me know. <laughs> There's also data looking at nostalgia. So uh, loneliness appears to be associated with nostalgia, and nostalgia appears to buffer the impact or the negative impact of loneliness, but only in people who are resilient. So basically, my take home message from this paper is when your grandpa goes on and on about that story that he's already told you 50 times, let him tell you that story. And finally, um, eudaimonia, or this concept of general well-being and purpose of life, has been inversely correlated with loneliness as well. Um, again, that's something that's difficult to encourage in somebody, but is actually enhanced in later life. So that could be a really positive factor as well. So what about HIV? Do we know if there are any positive factors that can combat loneliness in older adults who are living with HIV? So unfortunately, again, you know, we don't have a lot of data in this population yet because it's only a, a recent topic of interest. But uh, we did a study that incorporated multiple clinics across the country. Um, it's called the Aging with Dignity Health Optimism and Community Study, or ad hoc study. It's got about 1,000 patients. and. Unique to this study, we capture a lot of patient-reported outcomes, including things like loneliness and social isolation. So in our cohort of both private practice and academic mixture, we found about 50.8% of participants were lonely.
higher than if you didn't. And, you were more, and if you were more lonely, you had poorer medication adherence. So I wonder how much of that you know, is contributing to this, this uh, only 60% achieved viremia uh, in older adults with HIV that we're seeing. You know, we, don't, we don't know. Um, but uh, I think some people will say, well, of course, you know, it makes sense that the older adults are less lonely. This is a survivor effect. And, and I agree. But I also think that what it points to is it's important to understand who these people are and what types of coping factors they actually have. Do they have eudaimonia? Are they wise? Are they resilient? What is going on? So what can we do about this? Uh, there are lots of different interventions around loneliness. Social facilitation is basically like making friend groups. Um, psychosocial therapy is the most effective and has the most data behind it, but it's the most difficult to do because it requires trained psychologists and psychiatrists, and, but that includes things like cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. Animal rehab is another one, uh, giving older adults dogs or cats, and there's even some data now that's looking at giving them robotic animals that kind of move and feel like a real animal. Um, that data is early, but you know, it's innovative. Let's not knock it until we see what it shows. Um, health and social care is more complicated. That's people who are in you know, care facilities or if there's like a geriatric rehab center. Um, befriending interventions are probably the least effective but the easiest. So that is, is like if you hear about these like senior call programs where you know, seniors in a community get called by volunteers just to make sure they're doing okay. And then lastly, leisure skill development, like a gardening club um, or a sports club or something of that sort. Um, and all of these work better if you engage the community first. So you know you, you, you have to do something that community actually wants you to do. Um, and if it's productive. So productive interventions or productive engagements work better than passive. So getting people to be a part of a gardening club is more effective than giving them a ro robotic animal. But what if, can we do something more? So just going back again to that slide, that conceptual slide about what factors contribute to loneliness in older adults or potentially contribute, can we do more than just help them to make new friends? Can we do something about some of these other factors that are concentrated or unique to them? And I'm going to tell you, I'm kind of stepping outside of the box a little bit to tell you about a study that we're doing that actually started here last year. So last year I had a discussion with Jeff Taylor and basically said, look, I, I want to try to figure out what am I going to do for, you know, like a lot of my lonely patients that don't have a lot of support, that need more care, that are struggling with stigma, you know, don't want to reach out to new people. What do I do with that? How do I help them to age in place? And he told me about this thing that he'd heard on uh, NPR called The Village Model. And he's like, I just heard this great story. You should check it out. So I did. And basically, what The Village Model is, it's, a, it's kind of a grassroots effort. It was started by friends who lived in Beacon Hill who wanted to continue to live in their neighborhood, but they recognized that as they aged that they were going to need some help. They didn't want their kids pulling them out and moving them to where they lived. So they all decided, OK, let's, let's gather our money. Let's pay an administrator every year to help us coordinate social events, help us get our needs met, use the talent of the community to actually better the community. Um, and this has gone and grown over the last decade. And now across the US, there's about 200 villages. But there are some challenges if you want to translate that model to older adults who are living with HIV that may be more socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, for example, there is a need to pay an annual fee, and there is a need for an administrator. Villages appear to work, but have actually not been extensively studied. Uh, about 70% of members of villages say that they do think that they've aged better or were able to stay in their ho own home as they age because of the village. But persons with poor health in the community are not commonly involved. So they're not a part of the village if, you're, if you have a lot of health issues. Um, and a lot of current villages lack socioeconomic diversity. They're mostly white. They're mostly female. Um, questions exist about sustainability of this model because you have to pay an annual fee. So what if you stop or you run out of money? And effective villages really require leadership development beyond just hiring someone to coordinate things. They need to also be aware of what are the resources that exist in the community. So we thought a lot about like how do we overcome some of these major barriers that would make it difficult to do this in the setting of 
older adults who are living with HIV. And to mitigate the need for membership fees and leadership development and expanded research knowledge, 